to uh, uh, this might be a little challenging. Here, maybe not here. People that that do hear sometimes the things I say, I know they can be challenging. And so uh, I wanted to start basically where we left out last week, um, First John. I want to start out with First John and uh, only begotten and the only begotten Son of God. And I want to kind of tear at that a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. And uh, and I realize that it's difficult to think something different when we've been taught one way and we think that way. We've been taught to think a certain way. You know, like, uh, you know, I was talking, talking just a little bit about funerals and having done a funeral this past week. I'm reminded of the, uh, the mindset of the, of the funeral. Most of the mindsets of the funerals are extremely emotional and that's because of course people have uh, let go of something someone that they love dearly no matter what the situation is and so that creates a tremendous amount of emotion and so generally when you're extremely emotional you are uh, you're vulnerable you make yourself very vulnerable you know what I mean when I say that and so words begin to be very important in that, in that period of time because those words can make an impression and many times those impressions become, we, we could say, lasting. In other words, that impression can shape your ideology, can shape your life. And uh, if that word that was used to make that impression is in error, then we live out of the impression of error. And we don't realize it. We don't recognize it. You know, for instance, and this is this would be common to most every person in America who is, quote, Christian, and that would be at death, that very impressionable time, am I going to heaven or hell? When when really the Bible does not even promote the idea period at all even though it's been told and taught that it does and so that's why words for me are very important so stick I'm, I'm stickier about words and what words mean and uh, what's behind the words etc 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 so I wanted to this will be a lot of a lot of things that would deal with words and the importance of those words so if I'm talking about only begotten son, I'm using that word only begotten, which comes from a Greek word monogenesis, and doesn't mean that, but yet you and I are taught that it means that. If somebody said monogenesis means this, and it's different from what you have been told, then it would be hard unless you were either a researcher or you wanted to Look it up for yourself. And I always encourage people to do that. Look it up for yourself and, and make, make, you know, make your own mind up. But I can tell you it doesn't mean what the English translation has given us the idea that it means, only begotten. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to take that word and I want to take the word life. Because we think that we only have physical life or temporary life. So the life I live here is what I would call physical with the associate idea of temporary. This is just a temporary fix. When that's not true either. Life is life. And life actually never dies. Life just continues to live on. It may be dimensional. See, and this is a conundrum, and I realize it is, because we associate life and death as opposites. But we live, and then we continue to live. Yeah. So when I say, I would say, well, after death, what happens? Well, there is no after death, because life, when my, when my take off the suit of my physical body, that's what the Apostle Paul calls it. He said, it's just a suit that I wear, or 
It's just a house, basically, a temporary house that I live in. I, being eternal, we use that word, and that's not a proper word, but it just simply means divinity or divine. It's divine in, in physical manifestation. So I know that these words are hard and they are hard for us to think through those things because we, we have our mind hooked into this death. I'm going to die one of these days. Not realizing that I can't die. I am eternal as God is eternal because the capital I, capital self that I am is God. Yeah, see, that's hard, isn't it? That's really difficult. You tell somebody, you think you're God. Well, what else could you be? Because God lives me. God dwells in me. God is me. So my suit is just uh, what I wear. It's just what I wear in this, in, this, in this expansion of my living. This is just one expansion of my living, and I'll have many of them, many expressions of this. So... So these are words that I'm working at. These are words I'm looking at. Now I begin to look in the in Scripture to look up the word eternal and everlasting and these things, and I realize, and I've said this several times, and I wanted to look at the words this morning, eternal. In the Old Testament, it's mentioned twice, okay? But actually, it actually uses two different Hebrew words in the two places that the English word eternal is used. So immediately when I say eternal and or everlasting, you think of divine are as God is. That's how you would immediately think of those two terms, even though they're not even used that way in their original language. And so in the Greek New Testament, there is no different word for eternal and everlasting. It's the same identical Greek word, but it is an addition to the text. It's not even in the original text, okay? So I know that these things are hard and difficult. So let me just jump right in here with John chapter 1. You can follow me through this and to, to exegete this particular book is, is beautiful and it's phenomenal. It is the most Gnostic of the Gospels. I've said that time and time and time again. And by that I mean when I say Gnostic that it's not literal. It's not about literal people. It's not about literal events. It is about the symbols the allegories and the stories that have tremendous power in them when we recognize them and we can understand them. So there's, there's just not a difference in life. Okay? God is life. The expression of God is life. And so let me read through this. And uh, I'll just quickly go through and correct many of the mistakes of translation, okay? And rather than to take the time to try to explain these corrections that I'm going to make, I'll just make them as I read through this. And you, know, you can grapple with it or even ask questions if you necessarily need to. In the beginning, the word beginning comes from the Greek arche, from the archaeon, and actually it means first place or first principle. That's what it means. It, it doesn't have anything to do with beginning like Genesis 1, 1, beginning. Those two words don't mean what we think they mean when we say beginning. What here in this Gnostic Gospel of John is referring to is a first principles that you learn as an infant when you grow and the very first principle you learn is called word. Word. That's the first principle a child learns. He learns, you know, even when he's laying or she's laying on her back in just a few months old, we are constantly trying to get them to say mama, dad, dad, or papa. <laughs> I learned papa for you. <laughs> no, that's a joke. But, but do you understand what, what are we doing? We are provoking them to word. Why? Because word always is a seed. It's the same thing. It's synonymous. So a word is a seed. A seed can be a word. So here's what he's saying. The first principle of everything, or the first place of everything, is word. Not was word, but is word. So I'm changing the was, past tense, to is, it's always present. 
everything is always present. When we get hung in the past or we try to project ourselves to a future, that is an illusion. That's an ideology that's not real. Your past is gone. Your future's not here. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with things that you remember, and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with the projection of the things you want to have in your future. I am not saying that at all. I'm just saying you don't live there, period. Nobody lives in those places. So the first place is the Word. The Word is with God, and the Word is God. That's hard for us to think. Because when we put it all past tense, we're trying to say God used to be and ain't no more. And we've been sold that bill of goods that God used to do this and don't do it anymore. But I, you know, why would, why would this essence or this energy or this power, this source that we so embrace, think did something 2,000 years ago but can't did it now? That, I mean, it's ridiculous for us to think that, but we do. We still... We accept that kind of mentality. So verse 2 then says, The same was, that should not be was, it is. The same is first place with God. It says the same was in the beginning with God. But the same is always, because if God's always now, God is always the present help anytime you need it. Verse 3, All things were made by word. Okay? It says Him. But as we look at this, we realize that He was the Word. Right there, verse 1. I mean, doesn't verse 1 say God is Word and Word is God? Does it not say that? Well, of course it does say that. So all things were made by Him who? By God. So you can say all things are made by Word. Now you can put that in your pipe and smoke and you realize that your world is built from the words that you speak out of your own mouth. And if you're not liking the world that you build, then change the words that you're saying to build your world. Right? That should not be complicated. We should be able to understand that. So all things were made by word and without word, nothing that's made is made. Verse 4, in word is life. Not was life, but is life. And life is the issue of what I'm trying to, to handle, or why I'm dealing with. It's what I'm getting at. So again, verse 4, in word, using that word him for word, or God, or whatever, it's a vibration of energy. And it's always present. It's not, it's not never or ever a time that it's not. It, it's present now. So in Word is life, and life is the light, L-I-G-H-T, of man. Okay? Verse 5. And the light shines in darkness. I could say it this way. The light, which is God, which we'll look at in a little while in Genesis 2-7. The light shines in matter. Darkness it's just light slowed down to where it's nearly not moving. That's all it is. It's light slowed down to what we call matter or material or manifest. But it's used here, it's, it shines in the darkness. And the darkness, it, the Hebrew word here in the Greek, katalamato, comprehends it. Actually, it should, it should say it this way. The darkness can't stop it. That's what that, instead of saying comprehends it not, it says can't stop what it's doing. Why? Because the Word, which is divine, it's energy in motion, matter can't stop what it will do. I mean, you know, uh, like I said, if your Word has produced a world that you're not happy with, or you're not, you don't want, change your Word. Because then your Word begins to produce the world that you want. The world that you're looking forward to. The world you're Desiring to live. Verse 6. There's a man sent from God whose name was John. Now this goes into a lot of mythology right here. And uh, I'm just going to read through all of this. But you can kind of pick up the ideas behind what I'm saying. Uh, verse 6. Says, there, was, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of, of the light that all through the light, the word, might trust. 
They use the word belief. Pistis actually is, should be translated words where you see the word belief, belief, or belief, or believe not. It always should be translated trust. There's a lot of difference in something that you believe. You can be taught to believe all kinds of lies and call them religious and think they're true when they're just a lie. And you believe a lot of lies and call those lies the truth. But when we begin to trust the truth, then that totally will transform and change the world, right? There's a lot of difference in trust and belief, right? I mean, you understand that, okay? So it's a shame that they do that with these words. Again, words, yes, Beverly. Would you say no in trust? No. Trust is knowing. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. When you trust, it's, a, it's an intuitive knowing. That's when Jesus said here in John 8, the truth shall make you free when you know it. That's the difference. Not when you believe it. It, it also implies experience. It does. It, it does. And experience will teach you a knowing. It will, it will always in, it validate your knowing. So, verse 7 says, The same came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all through, through word, through the light, through the word, might trust. He was not that light, but he was to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, verse 9, that was the true light which lights every man. Did you see that word, every man? If that light is the result of the life that God is, that every human being has that life, and you can't invite that life in you by praying a prayer. Hallelujah. That's the, I'm sorry, that's such a false conception that I can only have a certain special kind of life and I actually can't have it here. I have to wait until I die and go to heaven to get it. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But nevertheless, that's what religion has taught us. Verse 9, that was the true light which lights every human being that comes into this world, this dimension. He was in the world. The world was made by Him. You could say the Word was in the world. And the Word, the world was made by the Word, and the world didn't know the Word. You can say it that way. And that's the truth. And that's talking about the Word that is the truth that you can trust. <laughs> and that will always serve you. It will serve you for your greater good. Verse 12, But as many as received, to them He gave power to become the sons of God, to them that trust the Word, trust His name, trust the Word, which is born not of the blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the Word, which is God, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten. That word only begotten is one of Jesus. And I want I to put this back up on the board as just a, uh, something that we can... Uh, can recognize and bear witness to. Uh, and of course this circle represents eternity and I'm going to put a dot here and a dot here and I'm going to put the word male and I'm going to put the word female here. And, and it doesn't matter to me if female or male. It doesn't matter. I, I, I'll just do it this way. Because we actually first come from mother. They said, which come first, the egg or the chicken? And they found out truly the egg did come first. Because then it's the pattern. It's even actually it's the pattern for the seed, the word. So really what is that saying? That's saying that in the circle representing the egg or the circle representing the endless divinity of this word we call God or source or energy or whatever. So many different words we can use. But in that is this ideology of male, female, female, male. That in it, you have to understand because the ancients understood this term we call God to be androgynous. So they did not they didn't think of God or the source of the universe as an old man or an old woman. They never thought of it that way. They always thought of it as androgynous. Therefore, it, within itself, it has male-female principles. 
Now, in matter, it divine, it designed matter with duality. And always in duality, there's friction. And when we live from the duality of the physical nature, we always have friction. In other words, people can incur problems. But when we live from our divine source, our single source, our one source, there is no friction. There is no duality. There is no problem in that divine essence. Do you see what I'm saying? Can y'all grasp that? Where we, get, where we get in trouble is living in this dual dimension. We live here. It's like Jesus says, I'm in the world, but I ain't of it. See? I can enjoy it. I can enjoy its duality. I can enjoy its light and dark. I can enjoy all that. I can partake of all that, but I don't live by that. And I use that word sin. You just pause and think about that. Just think about these things. So, when he uses this word only begotten, it just simply means is is begotten by monogenesis. And actually the word monogenesis simply means by two parents that are one. In other words, it, God is both male and female. And God as male and female has begotten every one of us. We are all begotten by the source that God is. Okay. And we'll try to do some more. Right now I want to read you a... This is a note of some things I wrote just uh, a month or so back. And I just want you to listen to this because uh, it fits in with this understanding. If we can understand Life is something that is it never ever ends. It just it just it is. So when we look up or we look out, you know, we think we look up when really we're just looking out into space. We see the suns, the planets, the stars, and different things, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yet we call this space. That's what we call it. We call it space. Well, what is space? And I looked this up in the dictionary. And this is what the dictionary gave me when I looked up the word space. It says, number one, it's a distance between points. So in other words, if I look from here to the front door, then I would say space is the distance between here and there. Number two is the unlimited room in all directions. So then that would be referring to what we call outer space. So where is the end of outer space? And there is no end. So it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And you everybody says, well, it has to have an end. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it's, it, if we even tried to put an end on it, we couldn't comprehend it. It would be too big for us. Yet throughout time, our space, we have had and still have philosophers, mathematicians, metaphysicists, astrologers, and so forth give up all kinds of ideas about space. Yet what is space? We could call it the place of no thing. But what is between you and me? If I call this distance between here and the back door space, then I would say, what is in this space? What, what's here? What is what is between me and the door, is it, is it nothing there? No slash thing there? We could, we, uh, we could call it empty space. It's empty because we can't see anything. But does that mean that there's nothing here because I can't see anything? And you know good and well, the answer to that is that's not true. And I used an analogy a month or so ago about this, this thing I wrote here. And I can say that I can remember services here in this fellowship when I, we would be having tremendous worship service and all of a sudden something would just brush by me and there wasn't nothing to brush by me. But I could feel the wind of it. Now what did I feel? I felt nothing. No, I felt something. Well, but there was nothing there to stir me. What was that? Have y'all? And I know y'all all had that. You've had those times when something seemed to be there and you couldn't see anything, nothing was there, but boom, all of a sudden, cold chills all over your body. Right? We've all experienced these things. So just because it seems to be empty space, and we say there's nothing or no thing there, that's not true. That's just not true. 
Just because we don't see it, that doesn't mean there's anything, that there's nothing there. In this place we call space, or no thing, or empty, is where light, vibration, comes from. Now, well, let me read on. Let me just read what else. It's the place that we call space is where sound vibration comes from. It's the place we call space is where color vibration comes from. In other words, everything that is comes from this place. Period. Now you think about that. And that place is as present here in this room as it <laughs> is anywhere out there in space. <laughs> you got it? Because space is no where it's not. And it's everywhere all at the same time. And everything that's in this space is in that space. It doesn't change. In other words, if I want to call that God. And you can, you know, those are things that you can kind of meditate, chew on, to try to comprehend it or to make it to where you can get it. So everything is there. Everything that is comes from this place that we call space. Or we actually call it nothing. Empty. So it's not empty. It's not, uh, it's not emptiness, yet it contains everything. We can't see it with our physical eye, yet it, it's all the light particles that exist are there. And so what I want you to do with me now is I want you to go to Genesis chapter 1. I use that word, light particles. Light particles is in this place that we can't see, that we think is empty, that we call nothing or empty space. And yet there's a lot there. Now I want to show you several words here. Uh, and I know you are familiar with this verse of Scripture. You can't not be. You can't... Uh, you can't uh, bypass this. We all know this one. Okay? Uh, John, uh, I mean, Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, or chapter 2, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 2, and verse 7, we can all quote it. It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now that's a, that is probably as power chunked verse as there is in the Bible. And says probably volumes, literally volumes, could probably be written off of those 20 or 30 different words that are used right there in that very small verse. Again, let's look at it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now what we see most of the time with our physical eyes and our religious minds is not what this says, okay? For instance, we see a figure of an old man playing like in a, uh, a mud puddle with mud that we call dust or clay forming something. That's what we see generally with our eyes forming this thing we call a physical body. And somehow or another reaches the silhouettes down out of heaven and goes <sighs> blowed into his nostrils and boom, all of a sudden he just jumped alive, went running and screaming hallelujah. I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Kind of that's what we see. That's not at all what this says, but that's what we've been taught to see. So when I, when I look at this word dust, it comes from the Hebrew word afar, and I want to put that word on the board. I want you to look at me, look with me after this particular Hebrew word. And this word, this is what we have out. I just had one it right out there. Get it right here. Let's, let's use this right here. The Father. That's. Uh, the Hebrew ayin. This is the Hebrew thay. And this is the Hebrew rash. The rash has a 200 value. The thay has an 80 value. And the ayin has a 70 
value. Now all of these glyphs have tremendous meaning within themselves. These glyphs are just the same thing as signs. It's what we call signs, signs on the road. If we learn how to read the signs on the road, we can, we can follow the directions they're trying to take us. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So this is this word, dust. And actually what this word means is powder or ashes. That's what it really means in its Hebrew meaning. But it means powder or ashes of light particles. Or particles of light. It comes from this rash, this 200, which actually means fire. So anytime you have fire and you reduce the fire down, you can see the ashes are the particles. If you ever at night uh, built your fire and grab your stick and poke the fire, what do you see? Oh, you see ashes. You see these particles of light that just flicker and go every which way. Uh, and that's exactly what this means. So it says God formed man. We thought this word dust meant dirt. It doesn't. It says dust of the ground. The word ground is not erets from earth, but it's adama. And the word adama comes from the root word adam. And the root word adam comes from the word alif dam. God man or God blood or divinity materiality. It's the combining of the unseen and the seen. It's the word vibration building itself in matter. Just exactly what we read right there in John chapter 1. So that's this word right here. And that's the Hebrew word afar. And actually it's taken from this root word. And I want you to just see the root of this word. And this is, this is pretty phenomenal when you start to see it. It's taken from this root word, and this root word actually is off, off, and this word off actually means uh, morning, morning ray, R A Y, or it means to look to the east, or it means to see the sun rise. If you'll do this every morning, you can watch. If you'll watch the sunrise for a few minutes or whatever you can so you can see it, you will be able to look into it with your eyes and you will be able to look and see that it looks like constantly coming from the sun are these particles of light. It's phenomenal. If you just do it, if you just watch it. For just a, like I say, just to watch it for a few minutes. And so the idea behind this particular root word, morning rays, comes from another word, and I want you to see this word, uh, because this is very important when you begin to get these words and you begin to see these words uh, now if you'll notice this glyph uh, ayin vav rash and this glyph ayin fei rash the only difference is the middle word the middle clip. And this middle, this word, this particular word right here means yeah, its pronunciation is ur. Like if we said O O R or U W R, ur. Not or like like iron or or not or like O R like either or, but ur. You have to you kind of you get, and actually this word means light or happiness. Have you ever noticed that if you're happy, you feel light? Have you ever noticed that? And, that? and that's exactly what it means. It means light or happiness. It means to be bright or it means to be clear. Now, if you, if you and I would begin to take these words and see the association of these words and what they are dealing with, they're actually dealing with the formation or forming of you as the physical temple, house, building that God designed and built to live in. And this is 
how it's designed. It's designed to be open. It's designed to receive light. It's designed to give off light. And it's designed to be happy and, and express that and to enjoy that. And, and, you know, for me, that, that, that's just phenomenal. That, that's, uh, to me, that's exciting. It opens my mind. And that's, why, and that's one of the things that I would like to say about all of this is that if you get up and you watch the sun rise and you see those particles of light, the thing you want to do is always be open. Instead of closed-minded. And you're like, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> Is that not the most common thing? That's the most common thing I hear from people when I'm talking to them or trying to share it. Well, I don't believe that. I've never heard that before. Well, just because you never heard something doesn't mean that you need to close your mind down and shut it off. I always thought, well, why not chew on it a little bit? You know, or see if, if there's something about it that I might be able to resonate with. Maybe something about it that I might be able to even extract some truth from that I can grow from or grow by. Okay, let me read you something here from Dr. Kuhn to move right along here with this life. Life is life, life. Life is designed for you and me to live. And I, you know, I, I know you know and many times in my own life I'm not necessarily living what I could be living. Because of the circumstances of the situations that I trap myself into. And when I trap myself in those circumstances, usually all of those circumstances have to do with duality. Either or, this or that. He said, she said. <laughs> you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Usually that's where I, if I myself get trapped in these places, it's my entrapment in these places that pulls me down. And guess what I lose? I lose my happiness. I lose my life. I lose my morning ray. You understand what I'm talking about? They all, they all seem to come along the, together and get me stuck. And I don't want to be stuck, right? I want to get open and I want to, I want to experience. So this passage of Scripture in Genesis, before I read this paragraph from Alan Boyd Coon, this passage in Genesis, And the Lord God formed man of the dust, a fodder, like particles of the Adama, that special material that comes from the light particles. That's what that is. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life. So how does life come into you? Breath. How does life leave you? Breath. That's how it comes and goes. Did life cease to be? Did life cease to be when it was breathing you? No. Did life cease to be when it left you? No. Life don't die. Life don't die. Life is always. It may take off a suit. It may put one on. It may move out of a house. It moves into another. But life doesn't stop. Life don't die. We're just taught that it does. And it says, and when this happened, when he breathed into him, when he, when this air, light entered into him. He breathed into him. What does it say he did? He became a living soul. Now this word soul, what does it have to do with life? Well, they, this is a conundrum right here. And I, I'm praying that you can have it here to hear this. And I've done lots of teaching in the past on soul. And I realize that many of the things I say about it are rather different. But soul and spirit aren't synonyms. You can't, you can't interchange the word soul for spirit. You can't interchange the word spirit for soul. They're not synonyms. They are different words. They have totally different meanings. Okay? So here we go. Let me read this. It may be, it may be a timely, may be timely to answer the perspective question as to how souls came here. What he's saying here, out of the background of what he had been talking about in this book, was that the soul, which is a special design of God, I'll talk about it some in a minute, seeks to be in, in some kind of a dimensional reality. It's designed for that purpose. Okay? Spirit is. It's, it's, it is. Even in a non-dimensional reality, spirit still is. But soul is designed to be in a dimensional reality. But it still carries spirit within it because it's of divine essence. So, they're not the same thing. 
even though they're not separable. They're the two sides of one coin. So when you have one, you have the other. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. But they are they aren't the same. And if we can, if as we learn and get the distinction of them, we will be able to to uh, grasp a whole lot more. So here's a note that I wrote here, just to kind of give some clarity to soul. We do need a better understanding of the word soul, its function, its purpose, and its design. Its design is out from source, life, spirit, or God. Okay? That its design is from out of that. So it has purpose. It has purpose. Its purpose, now listen to this, its purpose is sensual. That's why most people always associate soul with sensuality. And that's not wrong. It's not, it's not bad. As a matter of fact, the soul is very egoic simply because you can't have an ego without having your sensual being. Because the ego sees through your eyes. The ego smells through your nose. The ego tastes through your lips. The ego hears through your ears. And the ego feels through the apparatus you call your body. It's not right or wrong. What becomes wrong is when we allow sensuality to control me, to rule me. But as long as I control my sensuality, I'm in control of it. I can extract from it my greater good. You see what I'm saying? So anyway, I do, I've done a lot of teaching on the soul. So he says it's time to answer this question, how do souls come here? If their presence here is a supportable fact, it will be wondered why the rationale of this prime item of truth has not been the quest of universal inquiry. The reason for its being kept so deep in shadow is that the great literature which had embalmed the clues to the secret, the mythologies, the mystery rituals, the esoteric instructions in the academies, the books, and he lists the whole, he lists 15 different books of including the Talmud and the Bible, had never been, if these books had never been read with either the keys or the power to discern their true cryptic purport. And I want to tell you, that's one of our greatest problems. Jesus addressed that. If you remember the Gospels, He said the Sadducees and the Pharisees, I can just say it this way, the evangelists and the preachers of our day and time don't have the keys and don't want you to have the keys and have actually thrown them away several thousand years ago and wouldn't know one if they had it. Why? Because they have accepted religious ideologies called beliefs instead of the truth. And so it's difficult. The keys of power to discern the cryptic purport. The blind violence, listen to what he says, the blind violence of the Christianized Roman power that closed the Platonic academies in the Hel Hellenic world threw away the keys that might have unlocked their inner casket of mysteries. The Italian Renaissance pried open the lock and raised the lid. And it did. I, I mean, a lot of the material that I search from comes from out of the Renaissance from around 1100s, plumb on up into the 1700s. Most all of the material you can grasp from back in that period of time, especially if it's from the Renaissance, it will be about these keys. It will be about unlocking the mysteries of the essence of the divine. We are in a rebirthing of that Renaissance right now. And the reason I know that is because many... Uh, most of the ancient material that helped this kind of information is being made available again. You know, it's a book like this. It's coming back in print. And other books that were actually taken out of print are being put back in print right now. Good material that we need to have. And, and the reason I say that we do need to have it is because the Renaissance, as he says, they, uh, they pried open. They raised the lid a little bit. But they didn't raise it up far enough to give us a clear view, but they gave us some glimpse of these precious truths. And it's up to you and me to take the, uh, the weight 
of their responsibility to pry open this lid, to pry open these truths, and let the world see who they really are. Let them see what they're really made of. So, he goes on and he says, these precious treasures, these precious treasures are the truths that are locked in the mysteries. How did the forms of truth come to be out there in nature? The, the answer is simple. The divine mind conceived them and put them there. So what he's saying is we can find all of these truths if we just watch nature, watch the animals, watch the trees, watch the weather, everything in nature. The sun, the moon, the stars. If we do that, we learn to, because that, God's in it. They are there because they are, they are the precipitated in products of God's thinking. They are the physical echo of the uttered words of voice. That's what we read about in John chapter 1. Seed and vibration. The divine word, the logos, frozen in matter. You think about that. So how do you want to unfreeze it? How do you want to thaw it looking into matter? finding it there and setting it free. Hallelujah, so that it can be what, what it's to be for you and me. The ringing tones of his voice carried the form of his divine ideas outward and ended their course in the arms of matter. His archetypal ideas were snagged by the inertia of matter and held bound in the world of visible, tangible forms and here the soul stands before us. If you can hear that, why did the soul come here to teach you and me how to unlock the mysteries that are all around us, everywhere, there speaking and telling us the profoundness of the Word of God or the vibration of God or the energy of God. Now, I've only got a few minutes to get to these two words that I've keep mentioning in the Bible, and that's eternal. I only look at eternal. It's mentioned twice. So if you'll go with me here to Deuteronomy and uh, I want you to see this. It's uh, next to the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 33. And the word Deuteronomy Two words, deuter, which means dual, and omni, which means word or principle, or you can call it law if you'd like. Law only by meaning principle. Right? Deuter, omni. Dual principle are the principles of duality and the word that's in duality. So the book of Deuteronomy, that's what it's about. It's about how the principles of the one work and function in the two to make it one. Hello? Do you get that? It's how the principles of divine essence, i.e. God, which is, is all in all, works in this dimension of duality, which is a conundrum. But it works in this dimension of duality to not make it dual, dual but to make it one. To make it singular without taking its duality from it. I know that's such a hard pill to swallow. And so, this next to the last chapter of this book, I want you to read this is where we find this first use of the Hebrew word that's translated into the English word eternal. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. It never has meant that. So here it is in chapter 33, verse 27. It's the first place we see it. And it says, the eternal. Right? You see that? You see that word? Eternal? It's actually the Hebrew word, quad or kedma. Quad or kedma. It starts out, let me just spell it for you. <coughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to use it to put some words up here with it. Quad or quad or kedma. So, uh, that's the Hebrew kol. 
and it refers to the back of the head actually as far as the symbol. That's the Hebrew. This is a hundred value. This is a four value. That's the Dalit. That's the Mim, 40 value, materiality, the Him, the mother, the matter, material, all those different concepts and ideas. And that's the hay. It's feminine or reproductive. So that's that Hebrew word right there, Kodma. And actually, it means the forepart. <coughs> it means to front. You know, I was actually talking to you about watching the sunrise, the east. That's where the sun always, <laughs> you know, it always rises in the east. They never not going to rise in the east. That's the front, the forepart. And yet, this word is translated eternal. You know, and it should actually have been translated to the open or the forefront or the face. In other words, when you forefront, you face the sun, you open to it. That's what this word means. Well, translated eternal. It doesn't mean uh, like, like we have the idea of eternal. It uh, be Mark. This might be up right here. Eternal. It doesn't have the idea that we have. It doesn't have that idea. It has a different idea. It has a, it has a, the idea of being open and facing. Here go, Mark. Being open and facing the light. You, you yeah. understand? The light as a type of the essence, the energy, or the Word of God emanating to me. So if I'm open to that, I'm facing that, I'm listening to that, and yet we call it eternal. Now look at this passage of Scripture because this, this gets very interesting to me as I begin to look at this. So here we have two words, eternal, which actually means to open or to face, to face the east, to be forward toward the face of God. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs> God, you know, you've heard, you've heard these old church hymns. The everlasting arms. I can't remember exactly lean, how it goes. Lean, lean, leaning, leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. How's it go, Mark? Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarm. You know, yeah. How did they come back? I mean, where'd they come from? You know, they sort of like they stuck in there, you know. But you look at these words, everlasting arms here. And when we begin to look at this, and we and I, and again, this word everlasting is the same Hebrew word that's used over in Isaiah for the word eternal. So the word everlasting is always the same exact word. And when we see that word, it's the Hebrew word olam. Olam. And it's spelled completely different. And actually the word olam just simply means a secret. You see, it's sort of like God says, look, I have a secret. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my secret in you and then I'll unveil the secret so that you have, so you have something sealed inside you and that's called everlasting. It's the secret of God about the mysteries of God and He gives you the key to unlock the mystery so that you can see the secret. Oh, my goodness gracious name. And then He says He sealed it under the everlasting arms and the word arms in the Hebrew actually just simply means the power and the strength. And everything that He's saying right here, I want you to back up with me. Let's just read the verse again so that I can read it all. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms and he shall thrust out the enemy from before you. Actually what he's saying enemy here, he's just saying negative are those things that come that are constantly here that do come. But he's not talking about uh, this group of people over here that's my enemy so i got to kill them to get rid of them. It ain't got nothing to do with that. That's how we associate the word enemy. If we can associate it with the things that are negative and there are a lot of things that come against me that are negative. And so, and, and it's not my 
It's not my job to hate them. Because when we get into hate, then we get into a whole different level of dualistic energy that destroys me. There are more people right now in hospitals because they hate somebody and they feel with strife as a result of that hate and they can't function the way they're designed to function. None of us can. Because we get caught in these traps, these battles with these things we call enemy, when really it's just a misunderstanding. If we would recognize and realize there's not anything coming to me that God didn't allow to come to me, and even though it may stress me and try me there, it's there to be a teacher to show me how to climb another rung up the ladder. And I, it's hard for me to say, oh God, no, he or she, they're my enemy. No, they're my teacher. What I remember an incident happened years ago. My mother was one of my teachers. And the reason I say this is because she would make me mad. And I would get all frustrated. And I thought, and then God just spoke to me and said, she's just trying to teach you something. You know, my, my response to that was, oh, hell no. I don't even want to learn that. You know, and I got thinking about that. And I thought, you know, that's so true. That's so true. But you know what we do? We get caught in the dualistic world of division and we want to fight back. Totally the wrong thing to do. Instead of surrendering to it, say, okay, what am I missing here? God's trying to teach me something. Spirit's trying to show me something. What am I missing? And so, if we if we can do that, as we do that, my goodness, we begin to we begin to embrace many of the things that we run from, and they, and then they'll they'll teach us. He will thrust out the enemy from before my eye, from before me, and shall, he shall he shall destroy them. Actually, just said to me, he'll render that helpless. That's all it meant. Now, backing up. In closing, I want you to get the grasp of what this is saying. This is the last blessing that Jacob is giving. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 33, look at it real quickly with me. Verse 1, it says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. What is he blessing? He's blessing the 12 signs. Watch this. He's blessing the 12 signs, which are the 12 tribes of Jacob that became the 12, 12 sons of Jacob that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And you have to look at these things because it's out of these, this wheel, the 12 signs, it's out of this wheel of the 12 tribes, the 12 sons, that you're built. You're actually constructed out of that. Which, that's a whole different message. But nevertheless, you grasp it. Now look at what it says right here. Verse, and this is the blessing where with Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai. And Sinai, it it's not a literal place. It's not referring to a literal place. Actually, the word Sinai, actually, it, mean, it represents a place in a material time world where consciousness communes with divinity. Can you hear that? So what, is this, what happened? Where did Moses commune with divine? On the Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai, not as a literal place, but a place where you in matter, you in material, in your form, begin to commune and communicate with the divine. So this is what he's talking about. So now you, got, you get this in your picture and you begin to understand it. So it says, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Sinai unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and <laughs> came with ten thousands of the saints, and da 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 with the fiery law for them. This fiery law that he's talking about here is uh, the association of light, fire. You've got fire and the principles of God that comes from that. And so he does all of these sons. He lists them every one. He goes through Reuben, Judah, Levi, Benjamin, Joseph, Zebulon, Issachar, Gad, Nephtali, and the last one we just read about was 
Asher. And I want to read you this right here in closing from this book about Asher. Let me see if I can find it. Listen to what the name Asher means. Now these are principles that are in you. All these 12 principles are in you, these sons. They make you up of who you are. But here's the one about Asher. His name actually means straight, prosperous, and happy. So, you know, to put the icing on the cake, the last one that God begins to deal with is this one. He says, here's what I want you to do. This is, this is the icing on your cake. I want you to prosper. I want you to be happy. And I want you to be blessed. That's what the name Asher means. Now let me read what this man says about the, uh, the metaphysical or that that's beyond the physical meaning of this name. He says this. He says, in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, we're told of the happiness that comes to one who gains wisdom and understanding and the priceless value of these qualities. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Bespeaks the substance of true ideas, true spiritual bread, the word of truth. Both Jacob and Moses in blessing Asher were surely prophesying of a time when man should learn that all his faculties and powers are spiritual and not carnal and material. Blessed be Asher above sons refers to bringing forth spiritual ideas for this is the fruitfulness that is above physical generation. Wisdom and true understanding with the oil of spirit which is love Make the various states of consciousness in man harmonize. Let him be acceptable unto his brethren, and let him dip his foot in oil, means that spirit should be taken into all one's understanding, even into the consideration of our conditions. Isn't that good? That's that's the blessing of Asher. Now that's just a part of it. That's just a, the, a bigger part of it that he, that he gets into. But now that's the use of the word eternal and the use of the word everlasting. And none of them, none of them have to do with any association of an ideology of a heaven as a planet or a place you get to go to when you supposedly die. My, 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 my. But we have embraced it and believed it, and I tell you, it holds on to us tighter than a leech. As a leech sucks the lifeblood out of you, so do these lies. And it sometimes is difficult for us, I know, for me, to unleech myself. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> so, yep. hallelujah, we are about the process of unleeching ourselves. Amen. <laughs> the sun sets free is free indeed. All right, I'll just quit and disconnect right there. What's that book? Which one? That big one. Oh, that's called Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. That was written by Charles Fillmore probably a hundred years oh, ago. Fillmore. Yeah.